Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, I would like to welcome and thank all of you for coming tonight, as well as the thousands watching online. I would also like to thank Young America's Foundation and the Logan family for their generous support to make this lecture possible. This evening, you will hear from our guest speaker, Michael Knowles. The event welcomes opposing views and questions. However, questions will only be allowed during the Q&A portion of the event, which, if you do not have a question, if you do have a question, you will line up for it a microphone after the lecture has been completed. Any disruptions during the speaker's remarks will not be tolerated. A disruption will be considered as, but not limited to, standing, blocking the view of others, shouting, any derogatory remarks and obscenities, actions, etc. If you are considered to be in violation of any of these, on-site staff will have to ask you to stop. If you refuse to comply, UKPD will have you escorted off the premises. We would like to thank you all for coming this evening and appreciate your cooperation. Michael Knowles hosts the Michael Knowles Show at the Daily Wire and the Book Club at Prager University. In 2017, he wrote the number one national best-selling treatise, Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a comprehensive grade, which President Donald Trump hailed as a great book for your reading enjoyment. <laughs> Before blank book fame, Michael studied history and Italian literature at Yale University, graduating with honors. At Yale, Michael rendered the first ever translation for the English stage of Machiavelli's play, The Girl from Andros, which scholars hailed as a watershed event for the English-speaking world. In, 20, in 2017, he teamed up with acclaimed novelist and screenwriter, Andrew Clavin, to perform the 13-episode narrative podcast, Another Kingdom, which garnered nearly 2,000 five-star reviews by the release of its final installment, rising to become one of the most popular arts podcasts of the year before being renewed for a second season. Michael appears regularly on national cable programs. He has lectured at research institutes and universities all over the United States. Vanity Fair has described Michael as a dapper, lib-triggering troll. Please welcome Michael J. Knowles. Thank you so much. Excellent job. Well done. Hello. Thank you so much. Oh, it is so good to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, as always, to YAF for hosting. Thank you to the Logan family for supporting this entire tour, the Men Are Not Women and Other Uncomfortable Truths tour. And I'd like to thank, uh, of course, the university for the invitation. We've discussed many uncomfortable truths on this tour. We have discussed, of course, first, how men are not women. Very controversial start to the tour. We have discussed how the mainstream media are fake news. We have discussed how leftism is not compassionate. Tonight, we will discuss our final uncomfortable truth of this semester how Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> no. It's an important truth to get out there. No, no, I am, I am only kidding. I'm, I'm not kidding about Jeffrey Epstein. He obviously did not kill himself, but I am kidding that that will be the topic. We have something more urgent to discuss. I think, actually, it's the most basic, uncomfortable truth of this tour, a fundamental truth that half the country insists we all deny, namely, that babies are people. Babies are people. More obvious even than that men are not women. And yet half of our country denies this fact. In the United States today, if you disturb the egg of a bald eagle, you will face a quarter million dollar fine and two years in federal prison. If you serve foie gras, one of my favorite dishes, fatty goose liver, if you serve that in a New York restaurant, you will be fined $2,000. The city council strongly considered adding a jail sentence for serving that delicacy because foie gras is considered animal cruelty. If you ask your waitress for a plastic straw in Santa Barbara, that server could be forced to pay $1,000 and serve six months in jail because of the off chance that your plastic straw could end up in a landfill that then ends up in the ocean, then then ends up in the nose of a tortoise. A tortoise which could be served on the menu of that very same restaurant in soup. <laughs> Disturb the egg of an eagle, you will wind up bankrupt and in the clink, but kill a human baby at just about any stage of development, just about anywhere in this country, and you will be celebrated as a brave defender of freedom. You can't sip from a plastic straw because a South Pacific tortoise might inhale it, but you can kill a baby with arms and legs and eyes and hands, a baby with a heart and a face almost anywhere in the U.S. up until the point of birth. 
And if the governor of Virginia is to be believed, you can kill the baby even after birth. Most Americans think that this is insane. There was a recent survey from the Harvard Center for American Political Studies and Harris Poll found that most Americans, 70%, believe that abortion should only be permitted in the first trimester or in cases of rape and incest. A whopping 94% of Americans believe there should be some restrictions on abortion. Unfortunately, the remaining 6% seem to comprise every leftist politician and activist and mainstream media mouthpiece in the country. The vast majority of Americans want restrictions on abortion, and the left is clamoring for abortion on demand without apology, funded by your taxpayer dollars. How does the left force their unpopular abortion policies down everybody's throats? Well, they convince you that the issue is very complicated. They convince you that men, half the population, cannot have an opinion on the subject. Never mind that women are more likely to identify as pro-life than men are. And that's according to Democratic pollster Celinda Lake. Never mind that the same leftists who tell us that men can't have an opinion on abortion are also the leftists who tell us that men can actually have abortions. I am looking at you, Julian Castro. They're the same leftists who tell us that men really are women and women are really men, but the men anyway can't have an opinion on abortion. They will do anything, stoop to any depth, to prevent you from recognizing that babies are people. But of course, babies are people. They're people one day after they're born. They're people one day before they're born. They're people because they're human and they're alive, which means they're people all the way from the very beginning. It is not the case that babies become people at, say, four weeks old. And before that, they're eagles or something. If they were eagles before that, then you wouldn't be able to kill them. You would go to jail. But because they're humans, you are allowed to kill them. Babies are people from the very beginning. We can know this with certainty simply by using our faculties of reason. But let's look closer for evidence at all the facts that the left doesn't want you to know. Within the first four weeks of pregnancy, the baby's eyes, face, mouth, jaw, throat, and heart will begin to form. Today, you can kill that baby anywhere in the country. By six to eight weeks, the baby has ears, the beginnings of his brain, spinal cord, nervous system, digestive tract, sensory organs, and bone. By this age, she has a heartbeat. In 43 states, you can kill her. By 16 weeks, a baby has fingers, toes, eyelids, eyebrows, eyelashes, fingernails, hair, teeth, bones, a functioning nervous system, and fully developed genitals. At this stage, she can suck her thumb and yawn. And in 43 states, you can kill her. By 19 weeks, you can feel your baby move. And also, in 41 states, you can kill her. By 21 weeks, your baby can respond with movement to the sound of her father, to sounds outside of her mother's body. At this point, your baby can survive outside the womb, and also in 40 states, you can kill her. By 23 weeks, your baby's eyes will open. She will have visible fingerprints and toe prints, and she will very likely survive if born prematurely. Also in 29 states, you can kill her. At this point, the laws begin to get blurry. 22 states then impose certain degrees of legal bans on killing fully formed viable infants. Notably, seven states do not, nothing at all. Oregon is a great example of this. Oregon has had no abortion restrictions for the past three and a half decades. That means a mother can murder her baby as she gives birth with no penalty at all. And Oregon is not alone among these barbaric states. Even states like New York, New York purports to have restrictions on abortion, but they don't. They actually leave the door open to abortion at any point up until birth through vague language regarding, quote, threats to the life of the mother. To be clear, abortion is never medically necessary. But by pretending that it is, infanticidal politicians such as New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo can hide the enormity of their laws, such as the recently passed Reproductive Health Act. This law in practice permits abortion up until the moment of birth. It actually goes even further to amend the New York Penal Code such that prior to the law's passage, if you killed a pregnant woman, you'd be charged with double homicide. After this psychopathic law was passed, that penalty was diminished. You would only be charged with a single murder. Andrew Cuomo, when he signed the bill into law, had the audacity to say, God bless you all, to the pro-abortion politicians. He then lit up the World Trade Center in pink. Better to have lit it up in red. 
Cuomo's law was welcome news to Anthony Hobson. Anthony Hobson earlier this year murdered his pregnant girlfriend by stabbing her in the stomach. Prosecutors initially hoped to nail him on double homicide. But thanks to Cuomo's law, Hobson now faces a far lighter sentence. New York has long been key for the abortion industry. New York shows us also the particularly devastating effects of abortion on minority populations. Nationally, 36% of all abortions are performed on black women, even though black women constitute just 13% of all women. In New York City, 41% of pregnancies end in abortion. That is a horrifying figure in and of itself. But just among black women, the number jumps to 60%. More black babies in New York are aborted than born. In 2011, the pro-life group Life Always put up a billboard in the city that pointed out that the most dangerous place in New York City for a black child is in his mother's womb. This was met with shock and offense. The black city councilwoman, Letitia James, called the billboard, quote, highly offensive. The Life Always board member Stephen Broden, also black, noted that the billboard is far less offensive than the genocide of black babies currently taking place in New York, while white leftists like Andrew Cuomo smile and applaud. Now, in Governor Cuomo's defense, something I never thought that I would say in my entire life, at least he isn't as bad as the Democratic governor of another state that pretends to have abortion restrictions, namely Virginia. Back in January, Klan Hood aficionado Governor Ralph Northam said on radio that if a baby were to survive an abortion in Virginia, that baby could simply be murdered after birth. He said, quote, if a mother's in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered, the infant would be kept comfortable, the infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired, and then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. A discussion would ensue over whether or not to murder the living, breathing baby sitting right there on the operating table. The left rejects the whole discussion. The left says, oh, come on, it's the 21st century. We are simply keeping up with the rest of the world. But that is not true. In fact, the United States is very much an outlier in its barbaric embrace of abortion. In France, a nation that is in many ways far more progressive and secular than the United States, abortion is severely restricted. In France, you can only procure an abortion up until the 12th week of pregnancy. The people who invented the guillotine have a more life-affirming view of abortion than we do. 12 weeks. That is a far cry from making the baby comfortable before snuffing out its life on an operating table in Virginia. Beyond the mere crime of killing an innocent baby, abortion threatens so many other aspects of society and causes so many other social ills. St. Teresa of Calcutta explained how during a wonderful speech to the United Nations in 1994. St. Teresa said, quote, the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion because it is war against the child, a direct killing of the innocent child, murder by her mother herself. If we accept that a mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? By abortion, the mother does not learn to love but kills even her own child to solve her problems. And by abortion, the father is told that he does not have to take any responsibility at all for the child he has brought into the world. The father is likely to put other women into the same trouble. Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use any violence to get what they want. We're seeing that. We're seeing the effects of this prediction increasingly in our own country. Increasingly, we eschew the civilized politics of good faith discussion and love of our fellow countrymen for political violence. Look no further than groups like Antifa, which use violence to silence their ideological opponents. Look at, forget just Antifa, look at mainstream leftists like Hillary Clinton, who said that you cannot be civil with people who disagree with you politically. Look at Maxine Waters, sitting congressman, who said that we need to mob conservatives when we see them in the streets, that we need to physically threaten and intimidate them when we see conservatives in the streets. Abortion affects so much of our public policy. Take just immigration, hotly contested political issue, a central political issue. The reason that no politician of any party has made real progress on the issue of immigration is because it, it goes beyond a mere question of preference. Do we want more immigrants or fewer immigrants? Do we want to only focus on illegal immigration or legal immigration as well? 
at the bottom of that, underneath all of that, there is a question of necessity. Americans are not having enough babies. Last year, live births in the United States fell to a 32-year low, just below 3.8 million babies born. And the way the math works is shocking. The birth rate fell to 1.7 births per couple, well below the replacement rate of 2.1. We need an additional 1 million new Americans each year to stave off the social and economic decay of a dying population. One million, keep that number in mind. One million is almost precisely the same number of American babies aborted last year. One million is almost exactly the same number of legal immigrants that we imported into the United States to make up for the American babies that we killed. And abortion and the immigration issue becomes nothing. It goes away. One million babies per year. 60 million babies killed since Roe versus Wade. That is the population of Italy. That's 10 times the number of Jews murdered by Hitler during the Holocaust. That's 35 times the number of people killed by Stalin in the gulags. That is 750 times the number of people slaughtered by the Aztecs to appease their gods at Tenochtitlan. And the Aztecs are an important point of reference here. You know, we fancy ourselves so much more advanced than those ancient and medieval pagans. We do exactly the same thing that they did. We do worse. We sacrifice our children to our own gods, the gods of career, of wealth, of perverted liberty, and of self. And we don't even have the guts to admit it. We pretend not even to know our false gods. At least the pagan tribes respected their human sacrifices enough to consecrate their deaths. We send our human sacrifices in trash bags to, to landfills. And that is only unless the high priests of abortion at Planned Parenthood can make a buck by selling their bodies to the highest bidder. Some pro-life advocates have suggested that we should make our arguments about abortion with, without reference to religion. They say, oh, religion, it's too divisive. Oh, you're focusing too much on that. Better to stick with secular arguments, using only the vague language of, say, human rights, or appealing to the social goods, the utilitarian benefits of not killing a million babies a year. These are all fine arguments to make. But the secular arguments fundamentally favor the left because they deny and ignore the dignity of the human person. For years as a teenager, I would have called myself pro-choice. I was a supporter of legal abortion for a long time. And many of the arguments that I made were cribbed from blogs and pop econ books like Freakonomics, you know, all these very stupid arguments. But when you're a teenager, you think they're really good arguments. The arguments would say that by having abortion, you decrease welfare dependency. They'll say, by having abortion, you lower the crime rate. By the way, completely bogus arguments, and yet they were made with seriousness. Even if they weren't bogus arguments, they're repugnant. I, I'll never forget a lunch that I had with a, a teacher of mine, a bioethics teacher, a woman. We were having lunch, and the subject of abortion came up. And I thought, OK, I support abortion. And this is a woman, so obviously she supports abortion, because the, the guys on the mainstream media told me that all women support abortion. So I said, I support it. She said, OK, Michael, why? I gave her all of my usual utilitarian arguments. Oh, welfare, oh, you know, lowering the crime rate. And she said, OK, Michael, which of those arguments could not equally be applied to killing off whole classes of people in the inner city? If you're not going to begin your argument from the intrinsic value of human life, if it's just going to be about what's better or worse for society, why only stop at killing the two-month-old baby? Why not kill someone who's 22, 23 years old? Even if the bogus arguments were true, who cares if welfare dependency kicks, ticks down 3% if it comes at the cost of genocide? The repugnance of my own arguments hit me very suddenly. What sort of psychopath would try to put a price on human life? Cardinal Manning famously observed that all human conflict is at bottom theological. On the one side, there are those in this country who would sacrifice our children to the various false gods of modernity. According to this view, human life has no intrinsic worth. According to this view, another person's life is no more important than our own convenience. Their pain, no more important than our pleasure. If innocent human life has no intrinsic value, then nothing can have value. There can be no coherent moral order. We cease to regard ourselves as spiritual beings. We become 
nothing more than clumps of cells. The alternative to this repugnant view of these sophisters, economists, and calculators, to borrow Edmund Burke's phrase, is an affirmation of human dignity, a recognition that man is made in the image of God, a dignified obedience to a transcendent moral order. In the rejection of this false liberty of selfishness, we find the spirit of an exalted freedom. Thank you very much. All right. I, I believe we've got time to take questions. You know, over at the Daily Wire, we have a rule, which I strongly disagree with, but we have to do it anyway, which is that people who disagree with me can come to the front of the line. And recently, I've been getting uh, messages on social media. I've learned that there are people on the right who refer to themselves as groipers who disagree with me. And so if there are any in the room, I don't know if there are, but if there are, please feel free to come to the very front of the line and I'd be more than happy to take your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, we ask that you go to the back of the room, um, get a line at the back of the room. Do not go from the front, please. Um, if you do disagree, someone will come get you. Please don't go up by yourself. Um, I will hold the microphone for you, and there's only time for one question. Thank you. Hi, Michael. It's great to see you, not on a tiny screen. Um, I would like to ask you, I'm a double major, and one of those majors is theater. Uh, what would what are some tips on being in theater and being in a closet conservative? I would choose a different profession. That would be my first tip. <laughs> I would change your major and immediately study business or something. I really love the theater and I love the arts and I think if conservatives were in the arts more and if they were drawn more to the arts and were permitted to be in the arts more, there's a, we'd have a much better culture, but unfortunately that can be very difficult. In theater, I often had to keep my views to myself or play them a little closer to the chest than I do now. It depends what you're working on. You know, if you're working on some really great play, if you're working on Shakespeare, for instance, there's, uh, that's very important work to be doing. If you're even working on a modern play, I was just rereading Oleana by David Mamet, which is a play, I think the first play ever that mentioned political correctness using Mamet's colorful language. And it's a great one. It's probably banned now from every theater in America. If you're working on something like that, it really matters. Unfortunately today, in Hollywood in particular, but in theater in New York, very little work of substance is, is being produced. Work that is ideological, it's leftist, it's not conveying any truths about the inner life of the human person. Or, or nature or, or politics or anything that we live in. So if you want to go into the theater, which I think is a great profession, historically they're lumped in with prostitutes and drug addicts, but you know, uh, overall, I mean, you can do quite a lot. But if you want to do it, I would make sure that you're doing it for the right reason. If you're doing it to seek fame, there are easier ways to become famous. If you're doing it to seek money, there are way easier ways to make a buck. If you're doing it to work on something meaningful, then I would be sure you can work on something meaningful, find the right writers, find the right directors, and, and go and, and actually try to produce some beautiful art. And if you're not going to be able to do that, major in econ. What an excellent pinstripe suit. Thank you. It's very nice. Your speech was lovely. Thank you for being here. I agreed with almost every point you made. However, I do have a single question, and that would be, on October 26th, you posted a picture of yourself with a, I'm not sure if it's a drag queen or a cross, yes, some, a, a, someone a, of that dra nature. A drag queen named okay, Lady drag, Maga. Yes, Lady Maga. Yeah. My question is, as the title of this tour is Men Are Not Women, how is posing with and giving implicit, you know, what would seem to be acceptance, how is that congruent with your message that men are not women? I don't think it, it's a good question. I don't know exactly what you mean by acceptance. I, I mean, I, the title of this tour is Men Are Not Women. I, I probably would get along easier if, uh, if I were less clear about my views. I would suggest in all things, particularly in politics, that we, we strive for clarity and charity. I was at a reception at Politicon where there are a lot of colorful characters. Yes. 
Some, some, some of whom are, are even more colorful than Lady Maga. And I was at a reception there, and I had a nice conversation with this guy, Lady Maga. Very nice guy. In many of his views, quite conservative. I think he's publicly referred to LGBT as a cult. He's publicly opposed Drag Queen Story Hour. And actually, in terms of his views on gender ideology, the dresses aside, he actually seems to hold a more traditional view than, than most people on the left and some on the right today. Uh, but obviously, we don't agree on all aspects of gender, or the sexual revolution, or anything like that. But he was a nice guy, and I think it's very important to be able to have a conversation with somebody, and if you have a nice interaction, feel free to take a photo. I, I never hid my views. I certainly don't hide my views. I'm still on this tour. But it is very important to uh, not to discriminate in our social interactions with people. I mean, these people, no matter how much you disagree, forget about wearing a dress. I mean, even if we're talking about people who are in Antifa, it's very important that we're able to communicate in a self-government such as ours because ultimately these are our countrymen. And particularly for those of us on the right, I tend to consider myself slightly to the right of Genghis Khan. You know, not everybody is going to agree with my point of view, but if we can speak to our fellow countrymen, perhaps there's a chance that we can reach them. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Hello, Mr. Knowles. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say regarding that last question, um, when he said that you know it may have caused some confusion for people who may not have known better, I think what he may have been referring to is that the caption for that picture was, quote, a star is born. So for people who are not as well-tuned into the kind of um, social atmosphere of these Politicon events, they may have just been confused when mm. later on they go to your tour that says men are not women. Well, I, but, hope, I hope that my... Uh, but to my question, sorry, sure. I don't, well, I'd, I'd I don't like to respond waste to time. that point very quickly. You'll be allowed to ask your question. I, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I ca tweeted out a line, I believe it said, a star is born, a reference to Lady Gaga, right. not the same as Lady Maga. But, you know, look, if somebody reads that and interprets that to mean that I'm a uh, commandeer in the sexual revolution and they're going to come to my talk and hear a lot of leftist gender theory, I think that's a great idea because then I'll scurry them in here, I'll sneak them in under false pretenses, and then I'll teach them a little truth. Well, i got to give you Gaga and Maga do rhyme, but <laughs> to my question, um, okay, so this is a bit of a different topic, but there's been a kind of far left idea that has entered mainstream thought lately and it's been espoused by many um, conservative leaders. Uh, I don't know what you have said on it, but the idea is that America is a creedal nation. That is to say that we are defined not by our people or by our land, but rather that we are defined by our, by our ideas that we supposedly all hold. Now, you know as well as I do that Democrats do not share our same values. They don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe in Second Amendment rights. They don't believe that the unborn are alive humans. They don't believe in Christian values. So, logically following, would you not, disagree, would you not agree that Democrats then are not American? Well, I, that's a good question. Uh, and may, I, may I have a follow-up, actually? Sure. Would you like me to answer that first, or would you like to clarify the question? You can answer it first. Okay, yeah. So I, I am not of the opinion that America is merely a creed, that is just some creed floating in the air that has no relation to any land or any people or any history. That obviously is untrue. Nor am I of the opinion that America has no creed. America very clearly has a creed. It was founded by a few of my ancestors on the Mayflower. They, they had very strong beliefs and uh, by the people who signed the Declaration of Independence and fought the Revolutionary War and fought in some of my ancestors as well, speaking of people, and who fought with Washington and, and ratified the Constitution. They clearly had s strong beliefs about the country, and it was a country that was founded in a way that is unique in world history. It, it does not come from antiquity on up, but it, it really was settled by people who came here on boats, many of whom were were religious zealots and whose creed was their whole life, their creed and their belief in, in Christ in particular. So uh, I, I think the, this conversation has become very muddled because it's a country. You know, If you took every single American of, of every belief and every race and every sex and every sexual preference, if you just took them all out and replaced them with some random people, that wouldn't be America anymore, right? It wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. But likewise, we are not merely a country of blood and soil. We do have many ideas, and it's important that we think about those ideas because America 
is exceptional in the world. This is not to say, rah, rah, we're the greatest nation and we can apply what happens in America every single place on Earth. But we are exceptional. That is part of our history. And for conservatives who trace their philosophy through something like traditionalism or referring to the great history and heritage of this country, uh, to ignore that creedal aspect is to ignore an, an essential part of, of our history and tradition. Sure. I did. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that we agree, seriously. Um, you know, I agree that we are defined, you know, by our ancestors and by, you know, our forefathers, our founding fathers, right? And not just while we do have good ideas in the Constitution, that's not what makes America, America. It's, it's part of what makes part America, Part of it, but America. not primarily. And, the, and I, only, I, I only insist I on that um, point of view be, just because it's been espoused by, if I may drop names, um, Charlie Kirk Shapiro, that you may know him. Um, I, know, I know those guys. I'm friends with those guys. Right, no, and I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad people. I've never met them, and this is the first time I've met you. Um, but I'm just glad to, um, I'm glad to know that we do both, at least in this respect, disagree with those people, that America, that we are a real people, and that, you know, if the entire population of Europe came over and replaced us, that, you know, it would not God be America. God forbid. Could you imagine those German socialists? All those, would be all those German Earth. socialists. A bunch came over terrible. after, you know, World War II, and look how that turned out, That's right. right. Yeah, I agree. So. And I, I do think, you know, to defend Ben and Charlie a little bit, I do think their views have been misrepresented. I don't think that they, they really, in their heart of hearts, regard, regard America as just some total abstraction. I mean, these are, these are smart people, and I think they think clearly about uh, politics. And, you know, if you get excerpted in, uh, in one soundbite or you, you give an answer that perhaps you meant to use you know, one or two words differently or something, that's one thing. But they, they both have a long track record in, in public life, and, uh, and I, I, just, I just don't want their views to be mistakenly uh, caricatured because they're, they're sophisticated thinkers. And really, what our discussion is right now is over how much of the country is creedal and how much of it is an historical and geographic reality. And uh, to, to pretend that it's a, a simpler question than that, I think, is disingenuous. Yeah. Thank Good question. You. Hello. An article was recently published in the LA Times titled, California's Changing Demographics Will Further Doom Republicans. It starts out with, Democrats dominate politics in California, and Republicans are doomed for one simple reason, shifting demographics. It goes on to state that California is the future. It tends to be more non-Caucasian than most states. But we're heading into that for the rest of the nation. And how are Republicans doing in California? They've got to figure out how to compete here, or it's the ice age. So my question is, will conservatives like yourself acknowledge what Democrats already know? That is, that demographics is destiny, or is that truth a little too uncomfortable for you? Oh, I, I, I can't believe you just referred to the LA Times as the truth. That's an amazing thing. I, uh, no, I won't acknowledge a Democrat's truth because I think it's uh, not backed up by historical reality. To give a few examples, uh, five of the whitest states in the country. What are the five whitest states? You've got Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, West Virginia, and Montana. Three out of those five states voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Very, very white states. Uh, of, of those five states, by the way, four of them voted for Democratic senators, leftist senators, in 2018. That doesn't seem very good for the whiteness argument. When you look at uh, diverse states, not all diverse states, but some, such as Texas and Florida, they have voted reliably in recent years Republican and conservative. Uh, on to the point of demographics being destiny, of, of course the uh, left is uh, desirous of mass migration because they think that if they flood the country without any sort of assimilation, if they discourage assimilation, then they're going to be able to dominate the electorate. That's part of their plan. But the idea that voting patterns are somehow hardwired into DNA is simply untrue, and I can prove it in a few different ways. So for instance, right now black voters identify heavily with the Democratic Party, 85 to 90 percent at some, some points. This was not always the case. As recently as the mid-1940s, uh, black voters were about evenly evenly matched Democrat and Republican. And what caused that shift, some people say, was the New Deal. But the timeline doesn't even add up so much there. Actually, if you look at the exact date that things really started to tip, 
it was 1948 when President Truman desegregated or, or rather integrated the military. So you saw Democratic presidents taking up the mantle of civil rights, saying that they care about black people. And then, of course, President Kennedy and President Johnson get credit for the Civil Rights Act, which s cemented, at least in recent memory, black support for Democrats. I'll give you another example. Hispanic voters are not monolithically or racially determined in their votes. How do I know that? Because, of course, of the Cubans, of, of all of the Hispanic voters, Cubans, even today, favor Republicans, they favor conservatives. Now the trouble is, generationally, that starts to slip. So the Cuban immigrants favor conservatives. Even the children of Cuban immigrants favor conservatives. But then when you get to the grandchildren, that uh, becomes a problem where they start to veer toward the left. Obviously, that's not a racial problem. They have the same race as their grandparents. Obviously, that's not an immigration problem. The immigrants are more conservative than their grandkids. What it would appear to me more likely is that it is a problem of education, particularly an educational apparatus that from K to 12 and all the way through college and all the way through your master's and your PhD, if you stick on for that, you are told that America is evil, conservatism is evil, and leftism is wonderful. Uh, it, it's eminently clear to me that, that race is a minor, minor factor here and that ideas are the issue. So if we want to win moving forward, I think we need to stop these ridiculous and bigoted uh, ideas that uh, race somehow determines uh, what, you, what you think about politics and move on to a, a more human uh, understanding and, and a, a, frankly, a more reasonable and civilized understanding of politics. You can follow up, sure. Just, just last year in the 2018 midterm, whites were the only group to vote predominantly Republican. African Americans voted 90% Democrat, Hispanic 69%, and I think Asian I just said 77. That, didn't I? Yes, but what does it matter if they, vote, they were more Republican in the past than today? Because it shows that it's not racially determined, which would appear to be your contention when you say demographics are destiny. So if, if they're not racially determined, then something else is at work here, which is exactly my point, and it would seem to be not your point. So, sure. If I may ask, when then will they begin to re vote for Republicans again? Well, I gotta tell you, guys who push a, uh, an exclusively racial politics aren't really helping the situation very much, in my opinion. And if my thesis is correct, that the perception of one political party embracing black voters and another political party shunning them was a major motivator of the, the black support for the left, and that would seem to be borne out by historical reality, then what I would recommend is we not speak with racially exclusive language and with uh, political ideologies that really don't seem to bear much, uh, much with regard to reality and the reality of how we think about politics and the human person. It's a good question. Good evening, uh, oh, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Knowles. Uh, thank you for coming to our university, and I'm glad to see like some of us conservatives were probably learn lonely here, and it's glad to have someone like you who's here. It's my thanks for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay. So, uh, my question it relates to uh, the topic of freedom of speech and the things that we're allowed to talk about in the conservative movement and the types of opinions that are newly being accepted and the things that, yeah, the things that we want to have more accepted. And something I'm concerned about in our movement is, uh, is uh, and it concerns you working under the Daily Wire under ben, Mr. Ben Shapiro, which he's a great guy. People like you and him got me into philosophy about two years ago. Oh, it's not my major, but I like reading it and stuff like this. And uh, about uh, you and Shapiro is that, yes, we, I know you, you consider yourself a Roman Catholic. I do. And I would, uh, and we know Mr. Shapiro to have some Jewish, well, he's a, he's a, I mean, he's I'm Jewish. I'm pretty sure he's Jewish. Right, I'm not right, positive. Right, right. Uh, he right, wears right, a hat right. and he right. and says I, prayers. I think he might and, be Jewish. And yes, oh. I'm completely fine with that. It's nice that, you know, we have people like this. And we, with our, um, Concerning the idea of like things we're allowed to talk about and you working under him, you know, there's certain soft spots I know in our movement and along with working at a mainstream political organization like the Daily Wire. And, you know, I'll go out and say I'm, I consider myself, you know, maybe someone who sees what the Gropers are doing as something, you know, a, kind of a necessary act, you know, 
we need some recognition. And I know I've, I haven't listened to too much of Nicholas Fuentes, although he's a great guy, but I know that he has said that, I mean, you have a picture of him, and I know you probably, or he has a picture with you. Y'all both have a picture together. And I'm, I'm assuming that maybe you all, like, or at least you know at least the things that you talk about, that he, he and other people of these types of opinions, what we, this is things that we see very important rather than just, you know, like stuff, to be honest, the stuff that we've heard tonight, which is, it's great stuff, and you know, it's helped me a lot, but a lot of do us- Do you have a, a particular opinion that you uh, f f object to of mine, or an opinion that you wish I held, or that seems to be where the question's um, going? I, uh, not necessarily, but I, I would like to see, how do you feel yourself, do you see yourself in the future talking about more things that someone like Nicholas J. Fuentes talks about? What, what, what in particular would you like me to talk about? Um, I talk about Israel a fair bit. Yes, I've watched your, I've, I have watched your video covering the, I think the last one I watched was concerning like the embassy move and yeah. although I think uh, elephants in the room like Sheldon Allison should be brought up and concerning that issue. But I would say talking about, I would say talking more freely about Israel and Israel's influence in our, we have a special relationship with this country, but I feel like, you know, just commonly in our movement, uh, opinions about this state and how it influences our decisions as well as with Saudi Arabia. Yeah, we, we can talk about them freely, but you know, this, the state of Israel, we do have a special relationship that ought to be talked about more. I do and talk I, about it. Do you, I mean, do you have a, I, I, don't, I don't mean to uh, cut you off or anything, but do you have a particular uh, opinion you would like me to discuss or a question in particular about any of these issues? Because you, you mentioned, well, you know, you mentioned that I, I have this photo with that guy, Nick Fuentes, which is true. I, I was at Politicon, right. and I, I met him, but I didn't know who he was. So he came up to me after I had done a long line of pictures, and he pretended to be a fan of my show. I now gather from Googling him that he's not quite a fan of my show, but he pretended at least he to be a fan. On board with what he's, he's well, yeah, well, this, this is what happens. So he comes up to me and, and lies and says he's a fan of my show, and I take a picture, just like I took a picture with 300 other people, and then he goes on the internet and pretends that we had had a conversation or that we agree with one another. Or we've, not at all, I had no idea who this guy was uh, from Adam. And so I, you say he's a nice guy, he didn't behave like a nice guy to me. I'm sorry, what was the question? Have you heard his name in the recent Groyper uprising? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been reading the news, so I've seen him come up. But it, what's interesting is when he had the opportunity to speak to me, I mean, he came up to me, he didn't bring up any opinion of his. He didn't ask me any question. He didn't try to debate any point. Perhaps he didn't have all that much to say to my face, but he uh, wants to uh, merely insinuate based on photographs uh, or, or troll, I guess would be the word. And that's, uh, that's not a terribly serious thing to do. And you bring up, uh, you ask me whether I would talk about the things that uh, the, the Groypers talk about. I think I talk about every issue th that we're all talking about here tonight. We talk about immigration. We talk about tax policy. We talk, you mentioned Israel. We've, we've talked about Israel. I think I talk about all those things. What I object to with, with that guy in particular is what I think is pretty clear racial bigotry. And racial bigotry is, uh, I, I object to it because it is an affront against human dignity and it's a denial me. of the image of God. So what was the question? It doesn't affect me. It you, doesn't affect me. There's no accounting for taste, I suppose, but as far as I'm concerned, I think it's, it's pretty ugly and, uh, you know, with, with a guy like that who lied to my face, then lied about me on the internet, then called my colleague a uh, Shabbos Goy race trader, and then uh, threatened my other colleague with a switchblade on his YouTube channel. I don't know that that's like the nicest guy in the world. Just my humble opinion. Good questions, thanks. Oh, he also denied the Holocaust and supported Jim Crow. I forgot about that. But anyway, he's, uh, he, he did, he did. It's on video, you can check it out. For the, for the home audience, you can check it out. Hi, Mr. Knowles. Uh, first, I just want to say that I'm a big fan. I feel like uh, a lot of times in the past, uh, you've defended Christian values, and I respect you for that, even on issues that may not be so popular, such as uh, you know, same-sex marriage or men are not women, et cetera. Uh, my question is also regarding uh, the event at Politicon in which Mr. Nicholas J. Fuentes took a picture with you, and then only an hour and 20 minutes afterwards, you tried to slander him by associating him with racial bigotry and the alt-right, as you just said the alt-right, which you describe as godless. 
Now, Mr. Fuentes disavows racial hatred. He tries to disassociate with it. Uh, he also has a lot of uh, minority supporters, as we've seen at recent events. A lot of uh, minority supporters have come out in favor of him. So I don't think it's really fair to characterize him as a racial bigot. And he is also a devout Christian. And, and the reason I mention uh, this specifically, obviously a picture in itself doesn't mean anything. You don't have to disagree, or you don't have to agree with anything uh, that someone who takes a picture with you says, such as with Lady Maga. It's perfectly fine to take a picture with him. But my problem is that you have a very different reaction when it comes to either of them. When it comes to a, a young America First conservative like Mr. Fuentes, you slander them, trying to associate I never with slandered them. that person. No, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, but I'll explain to you what happened. I, I, well, I'll explain to you what happened and, and why I'm much more happy to take a photo with somebody like Lady Maga, who obviously were very different people, but um, agree on certain things, than I am with somebody like uh, Nick Fuentes, which is that Lady Maga is a nice guy, and we had a nice conversation, and we were very open, and it was a good faith discussion. And Nick Fuentes lied to my face, then lied about me on the internet. And then only when I figured out who he was because I Googled him, I realized, and some might try to refute this in the room, but it's all on video that he has endorsed Jim Crow segregation. He has denied that the Holocaust happened. He has associated himself with fascism openly. He said if Antifa were fascist, he would be marching alongside them. He has associated in the past with avowed racial bigots like James Alsop and Richard Spencer, though apparently now they're having something of a tiff from what I gather on the blogs. It is quite clear to me that he harbors racial bigotry. That's why I reject his politics. The reason I reject his photo is because he lied to my face and about me. Nothing, nothing in that is in good faith. I would take a million photos with Lady Maga before I would give a person who would do that the time of day. Well, I, I have a question. So the reason I bring that up is because I feel like, uh, I feel like you are actually slandering him because I don't think that he lied to you when he said that he's a fan of your show. I, I do believe that you both agree on a lot of the same things. I mean, he's you, referred to our outlet as a bunch of Shabbos Goy race traders, so I don't think well, he's a huge fan of us. Well, that wasn't to the outlet uh, itself. I believe that was to Matt Walsh in particular, and I, because, I think that's because of how he characterized. Okay. He's all, he only threatened to stab one of us and called the other one a race trader, but maybe he likes me. I don't know. Maybe. Could be. Well, he's not threatening to so. stab anybody. I, I, think he, uh, I think it was pretty clear from his streams, many of which I've now watched, that he uh, is not a huge fan of my work or my beliefs. Good questions. I mean, that was good. We do have to get to other people, but it was good. Hey, how are you doing? Um, uh, thank you for coming, first of all. My question is uh, kind of like after the 2016 election, after everything calmed down, uh, it, I don't remember who came out with, I think it was the Department of Justice. I don't know, but it was a map of how every county in the U.S. voted, like whether they voted conservative or liberal. And I noticed that, as I already knew, that big cities voted more Democrats. So my question is, why does liberal ideology flourish in cities versus the middle of the country? This has always been the case. Urbanization has always been a foe of uh, conservatism. Uh, I think part of this is just natural when people are living more closely together. They just give up some of their property rights. They give up some of their independence. They give up some of their sovereignty. And when you've got land, lots of land, under starry skies above, and a lot of guns and a lot of animals, you just don't have to do that quite so much. Uh, part of this, too, is geographic. You know, most of the cities that we're talking about are on the coasts. They've been traditionally left-wing places. But urbanization is a major problem because it could, it could end up, pardon, actually Flipping Texas, for example. You know, Texas is a pretty red state until you get to Austin and Dallas and the places where everybody is congregating together. Uh, what it seems to me is very important here is that when we talk about politics from even an economic standpoint, we must preserve rural America. We must preserve small towns. I think there is a, a certain libertarian argument that says, oh, just everybody go to a city, it's efficient, and you'll make more money. I've lived in cities most of my life, but uh, in, in that sort of shallow and economic, uh, merely economic view of the country, you could lose so much of your culture and so much of your, your tradition. It seems to me that will always be the case, and you're never going to see a map where all the rural places are really leftist and all the cities are, are conservative. That's not going to happen. So when we think about our, our uh, 
even our economic policy and where we're going to put resources even into towns and municipalities from the state to the local level, we have to think about preserving our, our American culture and our traditions as well. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Hi there, Michael. Um, so this is a bit of a business question. Uh, I'm obviously a mug clubber and a pretty big fan of Crowder and all the people over at Blaze TV. And uh, I was wondering if, well, obviously this is probably not going to be like a merger of anything like that, but the chances of potentially like a bundle, maybe mm. two, two great mm. content sources, one great price, like... Because right now I am, I am a mug clubber, but not I've ever a... gotten one of these things. So that's really... <laughs> I don't have a leftist tears mug, and from Crowder, I've known that they uh, allegedly cause cancer. So I want to be careful well, with no, that. No, you know, I, I will say, obviously, I haven't talked to Crowder about this, but I, I could see a world in which we try to combine our forces because right now the leftist tears tumbler is the premier vessel for drinking salty and delif <laughs> delicious leftist tears. But in Crowder's defense. The, the Louder with Crowder mug is the perfect vessel for the ashes from my cigar. And so I don't, obviously I don't want to contaminate the tumbler, but I also want to ash my cigar. So I think, pardon me, I got so excited. I think that's the best argument that I, I've heard yet, and I'll have to bring it up to Crowder. All right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, great. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Uh, excuse me, I have to pull out my phone because I have to ask this question verbatim, but nice to meet you. All right. Let me, <laughs> All right. Uh, Okay. Good evening. I just want to preface this question by saying I'm a huge fan and I'm humbled to be speaking to you. I'm not a student here at UK. I'm 22 and I drove here from Somerset with my friend who's behind me. He's also a big fan. And I just wanted to ask you something serious. As a Christian who was once an atheist, I've experienced many interpersonal conflicts over the year. I found Christ at 18 and I've trekked my share of peaks and valleys since then. Um, I found myself most thirsty for God last fall, uh, you know, most spontaneously creative and most conscious of my self-actuation and ambitions. Since then, I've allowed myself to backslide and kind of succumb to my past vices. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice to administer to me uh, about someone who's losing faith in himself sometimes. You're losing faith in yourself, but you're not losing faith in God. Correct. Right, because you are sliding back into old habits because sin is always crouching in the corner waiting to devour you. I'd recommend a good prayer. It's the prayer to St. Michael. It goes like this. St. Michael the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. I think it's important for you to keep in mind that we are spiritual beings. We are religious beings with natural religious longings. Winston Churchill said, when great forces are on the move in the world, we learn that we're spirits, not animals. The destiny of man is not measured by material computation. And as such, as spiritual beings, there is a spiritual warfare that is being fought. The devil is a real person, to quote Antonin Scalia. He has a personality, and he's out there trying to devour your soul and tempt you. This is natural, and the way that you can resist this is by clinging to your faith, by clinging to Christ, and Im importantly, by accepting grace and accepting forgiveness. I'm Catholic. I regularly avail myself of the sacrament of confession. It's like a laundry mat for the soul. I would highly recommend that as well, because one way that the devil can get you is he can run down so much your own view of yourself that you voluntarily turn away from God. You do have to accept God's grace. You know, you can, God will come all the way down the mountain, like in the Annunciation, God will come all the way down the mountain, but you have free will, you have the liberty to accept that grace. You can't turn away as well. You, you shouldn't do that, you should accept that grace. You know, one, one aspect of this temptation is it's getting you to think so much about yourself. The, the, the way to avoid this is not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less, and to accept grace, and go on and have a good life. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Michael. I wanted to ask a question regarding, you said you were Roman Catholic. Um, my question kind of regarded, uh, let me see here. I'll get this kind of pulled up. With the pillar of Western civilization, our grand narratives being eroded by postmodernism, I feel like the one of the main foundational principles of Western civilization is mentioned in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the sovereignty of the individual. How do we find common ground with those who don't share a common meta narrative, which is a foundational principle of Western civilization, the sovereignty of the individual, which you would probably, I don't think I've heard you talk about it, 
which is the principle that free markets and, and actual freedoms and rights can uh, stem from. So how do we find common grounds with those who don't even see that as a valid um, stance? You know, in some ways I think they do, and I think sometimes we conservatives straw man the left. I think the left actually has a very high regard for the individual. I think a, a, an atomized collectivist society, a modernist society like the, the left talks about, is actually it's based on the individual, right? I mean, that's part of the, the uh, effect of it, is when the left crushes our civic institutions and our traditions and our bonds of kinship, even down to the level of the family, the real purpose of that is to break us out into atomized individuals so we can be more effectively grouped together under the collective. I mean, this is true in the sort of Enlightenment liberal narratives as well, the idea that we have a social contract that in the state of nature we were kind of just like atoms floating in space and we all one day just consciously decided to come together. And that's obviously not true. I think the flaw of this kind of politics on the left and the right is that it looks at politics primarily through the lens of rights. And you see how this language is totally made crazy today when people say they have a right to a chicken sandwich or something. But of course they don't. Uh, I think it's far better to look at politics through the lens of duty. I, of course, am an individual. I, of course, have free will. I am a, I have a, am a dignified human person. And I am born into this world not in entitlement, in, in owning my body or something like that. I'm born into natural bonds of duty and affection and loyalty to my family and to my community and to my city and state and country. If we were to look at politics in, in that realm, I think we would actually crack uh, this sort of hyper-individualism and get back to a much saner politics that would turn us away from looking at each other as enemies who are infringing on everything that we deserve and look at us more as flawed human beings who can help one another because we love one another because we love our God that made our culture. I have, real quick, just one more thing sure. to expound upon that. I was just going to say, so kind of expound upon that. Without some form of shared story, though, for us to collectively kind of live into as a nation, what, it, what principle or what sets of principles do you think that we can come back to and unify around? Because originally, like I was saying, the foundational principle was America is not a homogenized country. We're not homogenized around race or um, politics. But we, the one shared principle was if you immigrate to this country is that understanding that, like you said, of you don the persona as an individual, and with that, you also, you, you do get the rights, but this is something Jordan talks about quite a bit, is you bear that cross, and you also comes with duties. Without that shared narrative, what do we come together as? A great question. It's, it's obviously absurd to try to ground our identity in something ephemeral that will fall apart. So some people now, you see it, especially on the left, though you see it a little bit on the right too. People want to ground American identity fundamentally in race as though there's A, a coherent white race, as though there's some pan-European solidarity, never mind that for all of history, Europeans have been slaughtering each other almost without stop. But in the history of the United States, of course, we were founded when British people went to Leiden and then sailed the Mayflower over here and settled and immediately created an alliance with Massasoit and with Squanto and other Native Americans. And then other English people came over and then uh, we imported slaves from Africa and then many other people came over here as well. My ancestors who were not on the Mayflower came over on sardine boats from Sicily. That was a little bit of a later stage of immigration. And there is a creedal aspect to the American identity that we were talking about earlier. The Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, that sort of thing. But there is something that's underneath all of that, which is the faith that founded our country. You know, the, the first great speech given in America is called a model of Christian charity. And the people who came over on the Mayflower had a very a zealous understanding of Christianity. And there developed in America a, a sort of a broadly tolerant Christian, largely Protestant uh, I idea, but that was religious. And in the 1960s, particularly with the Supreme Court decisions that made it like a felony to read the Bible in schools and took prayer out of schools as well, they, they pushed this lie on the left that secularism, that atheism, is the default mode, that it's sort of value neutral. But of course it's not value neutral and it's preposterous as well. So I think what we need to return to, if you want a real meta-narrative, is not even merely uh, accepting the you know, three sentences written in 1776, but understanding what, what the founding of our country was actually based upon. And that is something that transcends the political down to the cultural and ultimately, as Cardinal Manning said, all human conflict is theological. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the final question of the night. 
Hello, Mr. Knowles. Um, so I'm a student here. I'm studying mechanical engineering. And usually when I tell people that, I get all like, good job, woman in engineering. Um, until I say that I want to be a wife and a mother, and I want that to be my career. So I wanted to know how you would argue for or defend, I guess, what you would call my right to choose to be a mother and a wife. <laughs> well, yeah, it seems like you're the only sane one in a sea of insanity. I think you do have the right to a good life, <laughs> and I don't think you should say otherwise. Misery loves company, and there are many people, men and women, in this, in this modern culture that uh, tell you you have to ruthlessly pursue a career and ignore your, not only your romantic connections, but all of your social connections, and you need to ignore your spiritual life, and you need to ignore your civic associations, and just make that money. You know, what does it say in the Bible? Seek ye first the kingdom of money, and then you'll get everything else. Never seen a guy unhappy on a jet ski, and that's miserable. And we know that it's miserable because we, we can see the social scientific data. Rates of anxiety, depression, suicidality, uh, prescription meds, happy pills are going through the roof. Teen suicide is up 70% in the last two years. People are miserable because they're focusing on this essentially material uh, reality and disregarding the things in life that matter most. You know, Churchill said, the, the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. And everything that actually matters to us in our life, our loves, our hopes, our dreams, our bonds of affection, that's immaterial. And so I suppose if you want, you can have any sort of career you want. But if that career is going to be ignoring every other person in your life and every concern and just working in the widget factory and you made the most widgets per hour and then you die and job well done, I think that's probably a miserable life. I suspect you are going to put yourself on a much better path, and I bet your classmates would do well to take a lesson. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you all so very much. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you again.